Okay, good evening. That was the bell. Can we come in the auditorium and find our places as we begin this evening? I just want to take this time to welcome everyone to our midweek Bible study. If you're visiting with us, we're so delighted that you uh, took this time to uh, stop by and pay us a visit. Uh, please uh, let us have an opportunity to um, greet you um, before you leave. Just a few announcements before we begin our devotion. Um, Patrick is... Uh, planning a, a cleanup day around the outside and the main focus is going to be is spreading the mulch that um, was delivered um, a couple of months back or a month back. Um, the dates he's looking for is the 26th or the 5th. If you can reach out to him and uh, let him know which day works best for you as the 26th of February or the 5th of March. I want to keep in our prayer um, uh, Brittany and Kendall Lamb, as Brittany's uh, grandmother passed away, they are traveling to the funeral on this uh, on this Sunday, and so uh, the uh, the event we have planned for them, they're going away. We want to postpone it. We're going to try to do something uh, next uh, Wednesday after uh, after our Bible study. Remember, this weekend is the uh, marriage seminar. Brother Ote will be here. Um, we begin on Saturday. I mean, on Friday night at seven. And then we'll uh, continue on with three lessons on, on Saturday, and then he'll round it up on, on Sunday. Um, I guess the rest of the uh, crucial announcements will be in the, uh, the bulletin, that, uh, the announcement that got mailed to you. So hopefully if you uh, re don't receive that, um, we can reach out to you. And again, beginning this Sunday, we're going to try to uh, print some bulletin outs for those that don't have access to a uh, computer or not maybe as computer savvy. Oh, with that being said, we'll begin our uh, devotion time with a song. Go ahead, Mark number 718 will be the song of encouragement. 718. I want 
you have that, number 50. We'll sing the first and third. Five, zero. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and thank the elders for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, we're going to talk for just a few minutes about pressing on. And if you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Paul writes to the saints at Philippi, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And tonight I'd like to just take a few minutes and consider three points uh, that, that we might take from these, from these verses. And the first point would be, uh, to recognize, to recognize that our salvation is not secure. We can lose it. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imp for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. The second point is that we need to forget. We need to forget past achievements. And that may sound a little bit strange, but success in this life doesn't necessarily mean or equate to spiritual success. Notice what Paul writes uh, back in Philippians, again, chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Philippians 3, 4 through 8. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, 
concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet I, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. We must continually serve God. We must endure. Matthew 10, 22, 24, 13, and James 1, 12. We must also forget past failures. Paul obviously had regrets. Turn to uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. 1 Timothy 1, 15. Paul writes, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But what did Paul do? He went on to become an apostle and write several New Testament epistles. We have to learn to accept God's grace. Nothing is too big for our God. Finally, the third point is we have to press on. We must go forward. We must live as God would have us to live, serving Him and glorifying Him in the way we live. Notice Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to sin. Repent, ask God for forgiveness, and move on. Pressing toward the goal is an ongoing process. We must take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, Luke 9, 23. After all, there is a prize waiting for us. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul again writes, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So tonight, if you haven't already done so, I'd invite you to come down, come forward, and become a Christian so that you can wear that crown that Paul speaks about. To do that, one must hear God's word, Romans 10, 17, believe it, Hebrews eleven six, 6, repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3, and Acts 17, 30, confess Christ as the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32, and 33, be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, and 22, 16, and then live in obedience to God's word, 1 John 1, 5 through 9. If you've already become a Christian, maybe you've fallen away and need to be restored to faithful, faithful service so that you can continue pressing on. If we can pray for you or with you or you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing the selected song. So.
Let's go to God in prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father God in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for this day that you have blessed us with. Lord, you have blessed us with so many gifts, so many things that we don't deserve, Lord. You bless us daily with gifts, and Lord, we know that all we have comes from you, and we give you thanks, Lord. We're especially thankful for this time that we have to come together, Lord, as your children. We're thankful for Brother Mike and the message that he's brought to us. And Lord, we pray that we would take that message to heart. And when we become troubled and the cares of the world bring us down, that we would look to you for strength to press on and to look forward to the promise that you have given us when our time here on earth is done. Lord, we're so thankful for the promise that you sent through your son. We're so thankful for him and his sacrifice so that we all might have that hope of eternal life one day with you in heaven. Lord, we pray that you would go with us now as we go to our separate classes. We pray that you would be with the teachers and, and the students and pray that the teachers will have a ready recollection of the things they prepared and will present it in a way that will be easy for us to understand and be able to take with us as we go out and face the evils of the world. Lord, we pray that you would be with us and guide our footsteps. So I pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. We'll jump the gun. There goes the bell. Uh, hope that everyone's doing well and had a, has had a great week to this point. Uh, before we get into tonight's lesson, by way of announcement, just want to encourage everyone who can be there uh, to be there this Friday and Saturday, uh, as well as Sunday for the, the Marriage Enrichment Seminar. Uh, whether you are married, used to be married, uh, thinking about being married, I would encourage you to be there. Uh, it will certainly be things that will be said that can strengthen uh, our marital bonds for those of us who are. Uh, those of us who are anticipating being married, it will hopefully be enlightening in that sense. And for those who say, that ship is sailed for me, I'm not married, I'll never be married again, well, that's okay, that's your choice. Uh, but you may gain some information that may help you make a contribution to someone else's marriage. Uh, you may uh, learn some things or gain some tools uh, or become enhanced in some way that will help you to further make a contribution to your children or your grandchildren or someone else's uh, children. Uh, so just want to uh, 
uh, encourage us all to, to be in that number. Uh, we are talking about uh, involvement, if you will. Uh, on last uh, Wednesday, uh, we dealt with the fact uh, that for some, it's the idea that attendance and singing and giving of our means and prayer and listening to a sermon on Sunday morning, that's pretty much the gist. That summarizes their view of Christianity. Uh, and we've talked about the fact that there's so much more involved uh, in being a Christian, in a walk, a faithful walk with the Lord, uh, then just showing up to the building on Sunday morning, there's nothing world changing about just showing up and filling a seat in the audience. I would suggest to you that there's really nothing life changing if we're just showing up, not ready to engage, not ready to be involved. We talked about the fact that there are many who are leaving the church for several different reasons, but the one we really uh, honed in one on uh, was the idea that many folks are saying they're bored or they're not challenged when it comes to the church. And we pointed out that many folks are challenged or unchallenged or bored because they are not active. Uh, they're not engaged. They're not involved with the functionality in the work of the church. They are what we might call irresponsible, meaning they have no responsibility when it comes to toting the burden of the cause of Christ here locally. They have no, no responsibility. They're not working. And so we looked at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number uh, 15 and 16. Quickly, we'll revisit this. Uh, as the Apostle Paul, he challenged these saints there who were having some issues with uh, unity. And Paul wrote a description uh, to help them to understand the responsibility of every member. The idea that every member must contribute something to the body of Christ. The English Standard Version says in verse 15 and 16, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. In every way into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by what every joint which it is it equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The whole body depends on Christ. All the parts of the body are joined and held together with each part doing its own Work. This causes the whole body to grow and to be stronger. And so the question was asked, then I'll ask it again. Are there to be inactive, irresponsible members in the body of Christ? We take it a little closer to home. If you're here and you're a member of this congregation, the Chesapeake Church of Christ, are you to be an inactive, irresponsible member of this congregation? No. Every member must supply something. Our health as a body, our growth requires every member to work and make a contribution to the whole. But think about the way the church is intended to be. It's not intended for 10 to 20 percent of people to do 80 to 90 percent of the work. It's intended for 100 percent of the people to do 100 percent of the work. We think about the fact that the church is to be unified. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12. Paul helps us to understand as he talks about uh, or compares the church to a physical body. He helps us to understand that amongst the members of Christ, there should be phenomenal, phenomenal unity. First Corinthians 12 and 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are what? One body. So also is Christ. We think about that. And as Christians, we ought to be knit together in a single unit, which enables us to perform our God-given tasks. But not only is there to be unity, there's to be diversity. Diversity. First Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit were we all baptized into how many bodies? One. Whether we were Jew 
are Greek, where the slaves are free and have all been made to drink in one spirit. He will go further and in this context, immediate context. He's talking about spiritual gifts. But as we make application, even in that verse, he makes a, a direct uh, reference to the diversity based upon their status, their, their status, their class, I meant to say, uh, their ethnicity, uh, their social standing. Some may have been Jew or Gentile, we may say, whether black or white, Hispanic, European, African, whether rich or poor, educated, uneducated, from uptown or downtown, east side or west side. The church is to be diverse. We take that further and we come to understand just like the different parts of our bodies have different functions and different capabilities and different shapes, so on and so forth. That's true for all of us. We are different. We have different talents, different abilities, different strengths, different weaknesses. There is diversity in that, but that diversity can be beautiful when there's unity. When your strength covers my weakness and my strength covers your weakness. Everyone can play to their strong suit. A hand doesn't have to try to be a foot. Foot doesn't have to try to be a hand. It was Socrates who said, it's absurd, or how absurd, he pointed out how absurd it would be if hands and feet should work against one another when God made them to cooperate. The church is to be unified, diverse, and functional. First Corinthians 12 and verse 14. Uh, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. It takes us all. When you look at the human body, it's amazing how all the parts function together. They flow together under the coordination of the head. That's the way it ought to be in the church. We are to be connected to our head, Jesus Christ, and everyone has a function and a role that is outlined and coordinated by our Lord and Savior in his word. There's work for us all to do. Now, Kat made the point last week. She said, well, well, what if in essence I need help kind of understanding my role, understanding where I fit in? What if I need a Philip?" like the Ethiopian eunuch needed to kind of show me or to explain to me the way of the Lord more perfectly, or in our case, to help us to truly understand what is my place? What is my role? How can I make a proper con contribution? Who has the responsibility to help the saints to be organized and to be functioning as God would have for them to? I'm so glad that you asked. And this isn't really... I want to really make one point from everything I'm about to say tonight. But I'm not going to just make that one point because we're going to cover some things tonight that I've never covered with you all before. Now, I could assume we're all on the same page, but you know what they say when you assume. And so I don't want to assume that we are on the same page about certain things. I want to make sure, as much as depends upon me, that we are. You open back up to Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to take my time tonight, and we'll make it as far as we make it. Ephesians 4, and verses 1 through 3, Paul urges attitudes amongst the saints in Ephesus which express love and maintain unity. He says in verse one of Ephesians 4, I'm reading, reading from the English Standard Version. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
In verses 4 and 6, he reminds the Ephesians of all that binds Christians together. In verse 4, he says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, or one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in you all. Verses 1 through 6, we might say he deals with the unity that is to exist. Verses 7 through 16, he talks about the unifier. And as he begins to go from verses 7 through 16, in particular verses 7 through 11, he's going to make it clear that God has provided his church with certain gifts, uh, certain gifted uh, individuals. Now, I want us to understand as we're going through this, the immediate context is the first century, the first century church. All right. We're going to explain it that way and then make application to those of us who are living in the is it the 21st or the 22nd century? 21st. All right. But as we go through, understand this particular verse in its immediate context is written to the first century church. But he says in verse seven. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, speaking of Jesus, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. Talks about Christ's death, his burial, and then his resurrection and ascension. After that ascension, it says in verse 11 that he gave some to be apostles, or he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, or shepherds, and teachers. Now, before we talk about why he gave those folks uh, these particular gifted individuals in these particular different roles in the first century, once again, I just want us to understand the context deal with, deals with miraculous gifts in the church of the first century. OK. But what we're going to see is that in the first century, God gave miraculous gifts to selected ones who were empowered to receive, communicate, and confirm the inspired truth revealed through them. All right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, let's talk about the work of an apostle. You think about that word apostle. If someone ever asks you, what does apostle mean? It literally means one sent. That's what it literally means. One who has been sent upon a mission. Did you know that in the Bible that Jesus is referred to as an apostle? You think about Hebrews chapter 3. In verse 1, I'll wait for you to get there. We don't have to go fast tonight. I just want to make sure we're together. That's my most important thing. I don't want to go fast. I want to go together. I want to go together. By definition, an apostle was once sent on a mission. Christ is spoken of as an apostle of God, for the Father sent him on his earthly mission. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 1, it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, who? The apostle and high priest of our confession, who is Christ Jesus who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Christ referred to or spoken of as an apostle of God, for the Father sent him to perform or execute an earthly mission. We think about Barnabas. Barnabas is spoken of as an apostle, for he was sent by the church of Christ at Antioch on a mission along with Paul. You turn over to Acts chapter 13. In verse 1, 
And we're going to see first uh, how he was sent. Uh, and later how, because of that being sent by the church, he was referred to uh, with Paul in Lystra as an apostle. Uh, but he's referred to that because he was sent by the church uh, of Christ at Antioch on a particular mission. Acts 13 and verse number 1, King, New King James says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who, called, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them a way. The church sent Paul and Barnabas on a mission, missionary work. Look at Acts chapter 14 and verse number 14, when, there are, when they are in Lystra, and I'll speed it up just a little bit. References made, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in amongst the multitude, crying out. An apostle is one sent on a mission. But when we think back to our verse, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11, the apostles of this passage were those men Christ selected and empowered to be his apostles. When we're talking about the apostles in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11, we're talking about the men that Christ selected and empowered to be his apostles. They were sent by Jesus. We see in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 12, beginning, we see that the 12 are identified. We see where Jesus selected the 12 himself personally. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, it says, he went up, I went out to a mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, who he called or whom he named apostles. Who named them apostles? Jesus did. Simon, whom he named Peter. Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. One of those, only those, I want to stress that again, we're talking about being an apostle of Christ. That's what's being referenced in Ephesians 4, verse 11. Only those specific men who were personally selected and empowered by the Lord could be an apostle of Christ. Now, somebody says, well, what about Matthias? Well, let's see about Matthias, because what happened to uh, Judas after he betrayed the Lord? He killed himself. He hung himself. We find that in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 10. All right. So let's look at Acts chapter chapter one. We talk about those apostles of Christ. We're going to talk about we're talking about the 12 plus Matthias and Paul. Acts chapter one and verse 12. It says. And this is English Standard Version. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter, these names sound familiar, and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the Zealot and Judas, the son of James. Is one missing? Judas Iscariot is missing. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, verse 15 says, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was 
and all about 120 and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning who? Who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Talking about Judas, right? Now, this man acquired a field. This is making reference to after he was uh, remorseful about forsaking the Lord or betraying him, how he tried to undo what he had done, but it was too late. Uh, and he hung himself. Matthew 27, 3 through 10, you'll find that. Now, this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that the field was called in their own language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, may the camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. Another take whose office? Judas's office, the office of what? An apostle. Pay attention to verses 21 and 22 because we're going to find in these verses that one prime qualification that one had to meet to be an apostle of Christ. 21 says, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become, must become with us a witness of or to his resurrection. To be an apostle of Christ, you had to be a witness of the resurrected Savior. Verse 23, it says they put forward two. Certainly they had to meet the qualifications of verses 21 and 22. So they put forward Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice. And who else? Matthias. Verse 24 says, and they prayed and said, who's going to pick this man? You, Lord who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two, who has chosen? You have chosen. You have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own or go to his own place. Verse 26 says, and they cast lots for them and the lot fell on who? And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. We've got our original 12. We have Matthias. And now someone says, well, what about Paul? Think about a few verses. First Corinthians 1 and verse 1, just to make the point, I guess, and then we can dig deeper at other times. Paul says, he was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. First Corinthians 9 and verse 1, Paul, as he's arguing for his apostleship, he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? He says, have I not seen Christ Jesus our Lord? Obviously, the answer is implied. Yes, I am an apostle. I am free. I have seen Christ our Lord. Are not ye my work in the Lord? You're in Corinthians, you turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and if you want to actually see the encounter when uh, Paul or Saul had his encounter with the Lord, just read Acts chapter 9, and you can read it in its entirety on his road or his way to Damascus. But in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 1, it says, Now, Paul, speaking to the brethren there in Corinth, I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand. And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word which I have preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. 
that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scripture. Now he's going to outline some folks who actually saw our Lord resurrected. And that he appeared to who? Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom, at least at that time, were still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all to who? Last of all, as to one untimely born, born out of due season, he appeared also to me. The me is Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Verse 10, I love it, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them or any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Only those specific men who were selected by the Lord The 12, Matthias, Paul, one of the primary qualifications to be, or one of the essential qualifications to be uh, an apostle, uh, was having been witness to the resurrected Savior. Yes, ma'am. Uh, was Barnabas an apostle of Christ? Remember, an apostle means one sent. Jesus, as we talked about in Hebrews 3, 1, is referred to as an apostle, right? Who sent him? The Father. Uh, we looked at Acts 13, 1 through 3. Barnabas was an apostle in the sense that he was sent by the church on a missionary journey with Paul. In that sense, he was an apostle. He was not an apostle of Christ like the 12, Matthias, or Paul. So, each apostle of Christ received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which furnished them with the power to receive, preach, write, and confirm the gospel. We see that promise in Acts chapter 1. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. I know it's a little tedious, but sometimes it has to be this way. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after, this, after his suffering. By many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, who's the them in that immediate context? The apostles. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to reestablish a physical earthly kingdom in Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed to his own authority. Verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, we see, when does the Holy Spirit come upon them? We look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Is Matthias in that number at this time? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. When the day of Pentecost arrived, it says in Acts 2 and verse 1, they arrived. They were all together in one place. And suddenly 
There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Each apostle of Christ received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which furnished them with the power to receive, preach, write, and confirm the gospel. Now, we think about this ability to pass along uh, these spiritual gifts. Only a, an apostle, how did they get it? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Only an apostle could lay hands on others and confer spiritual gifts. Even if I had a spiritual gift in the first century, that would not qualify me. I could execute it and use it. I couldn't pass it along to someone else. If the miraculous ability was going to be passed on, an apostle had to do it. We go to Acts chapter 8, and I know, hey, we're going to stay together. We're going to stay together. For the sake of time, we'll read up, pick up in verse 14. After Philip has gone to Samaria and he preached and taught the gospel, and they believed and obeyed the gospel. But it says in verse 14, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Then they did what? They laid their hands on them. Who laid their hands on them? The apostles. And they received the Holy Spirit. We see further, it's further clarified. Now when Simon the sorcerer saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that on whom I lay my hands, they may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this manner, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Only the apostles, by laying on their hands, could confer spiritual gifts. And so when the apostles died, the 12, Matthias and Paul, no successors to the office were appointed to take their place. And so how many apostles of Christ are living today? Zero. Zero. In the first century, and we'll dig into this more, there was a need for the apostles. It was absolutely essential. We could not be where we are today without their work. But once they died, that was in of the apostolic office of, of the apostles of Christ. So, as you see here, there are many Presumptuous people through the centuries who allege that they are apostles, some in the Pentecostal, some Roman popes. Everything in, in Scripture uh, would prove that their assertions are false. They cannot support or prove their claims. And I'm coming to you, Charles. Somebody says, well, how can't they prove it? Well, one, one verse comes to mind where Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 12, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. He says, have I been a fool? You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these, as they were called, the super apostles, even though I am nothing. He says, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. You see, if a man was really an apostle, he could do a lot more than just tell you. He could prove it miraculously, like they did. Yes, sir. Um, 
one other interesting argument that I hear a lot of times is how can you approve how can you prove that the apostles were baptized in water? Good question. We're not dealing with that right now. All right. So I want us to stay focused. All right. Good question. We will deal with it, just not right now. All right. Yes, sir. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. If there are only 14 apostles of Christ, how could anyone transform themselves into something they can't be? Now, what, what is being dealt with here in the context? And what is he saying? What's the message? What verse is that again? Second Corinthians 11, verse 13. We back up to verse 5. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am, I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all times. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off all the opportunity for those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are and the things which they boast. There were some who were desiring to be regarded as true apostles. There were imposters, pretenders, false apostles. All right? He goes on. For such are what? Not true. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming, and when we get into the Greek, I'm sure that will be interesting there, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, appearing, transforming, mimicking, trying to emulate apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. We're talking about apostles. We're talking about, as Jesus would say, wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay, I agree totally, but in Revelation 2.2, 2, which is related to this, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. Well, if there's just 14 of them, you don't need to test them. All you need to do is, what's your name? Oh, it's not Paul? It's not Matthias? It's not one of the original? Well, well, well. Remember, we're in what century? 22nd. Did they have this? Mm -mm. They didn't have a written revelation like you and I have. They wouldn't have known there was only 14 of them? How would they know? How would they know a man was an apostle? He had to prove it, right? That's what I'm saying. Now, stay with me. We're going to get to how we know certain things. Did they have what we hold in our hands? No. No. Now, we're going to, it's a good point, but now, understand now, at that time in the first century, the New Testament was not compiled, was not a done work. It would be. Good question. Go ahead. It just seems to me if that were the case, the apostles would have just told them, look, there's only 14 of us, and if it's not one of us 14, Peter, James, John, etc." then they're false. That would be a simple way to test it. I mean, if you're not one of these original 14, you're, you're a false apostle of Christ. Okay. 
I mean, not, yeah. False apostles. That's, that's on, yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's fair. But we see the Holy Spirit is directing Paul to tell them about false apostles. Even in Revelation, he says you found them to be liars. They were individuals lying about pretending to be something they were not. In Galatians 1.19, it talks about James, the brother of the Lord, and it calls him an apostle. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So what, who was he sent by? Who was he sent by? I don't know. Was he an apostle of Christ? Is he ever mentioned or listed as an apostle of Christ in Scripture? In Scripture? Not, in, is he ever listed as an apostle of Christ in Scripture? So are you suggesting that... We're reading Scripture, and it says he's an apostle. So you're suggesting that there was a 15th. I'm, I'm trying to... Actually, under, yes, I am. Okay, that's fine. All right. What I want to make sure is we, we can parse things. And if you want to have a conversation off record where we want to split hairs, let's, let's kind of keep it where everybody can be on the same page. Not to just be argumentative. Let's make sure we're staying, we're staying focused with a big picture in mind. But what scripture would mandate that? What, what, what supports that view besides some implications that you, you're making? I mean, what, what, what would scripturally back the idea of 500 apostles? I read it earlier in 1 Corinthians 15. He was seen by over 500 apostles or 500 men at one time. Right. He was seen by them. He, he was, was seen by a lot of folks. resurrected Christ. That was one of the requirements to be an apostle of Christ. Why? Not the only? Okay, I'm just saying there was at least 500 that saw him that could have been a possible. But that is Christ. a fact. There were at least 500 who saw him. Yes. That's a fact. Now, everything else, there's at least 500 who saw him. We know that book, chapter, and verse. Yes. And my point is there could have been, theoretically, 500 apostles of Christ. Charles. Oh, yeah, that's, that's class, my bad. That is in the end, end of class. We'll, uh, we'll pick up right here uh, next Wednesday, Lord willing. Lord willing.